With Strasser pushed out and the Nazi party firmly under the control of Adolf Hitler, the party can now look beyond its internal dynamics and finally focus its attention on reclaiming power nationally across Germany. And this lecture, as you can see, is titled Out of the Ashes, because what we see is after the failed Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, a party is in shambles. They are barred from the leading cities. Hitler has lost his influence. The party is uncertain about its future while it's under the leadership of Strasser. And then there is that clash between Strasser and Hitler. Well, eventually that is settled by February 1926 with Hitler taking control of the party. But Hitler will go a route that angers some of his followers. And that route, as I referred to in the last lecture, was in fact following a strategy begin, begun by Strasser, and that was the electoral approach, going through the ballot box to secure control of Germany for the Nazi party. And this will anger some of the more radical elements of the Nazi party, particularly those associated with the SA. This will continue to linger on. There will be a lot of pushback trying to encourage and persuade Hitler to return to the violent roots of the party, but Hitler will basically stay away from that. In fact, eventually pushing back and deposing some of these advocates of violence in the early 1930s. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, so let's talk about what we're gonna be discussing in this lecture. And that is Hitler's approach to electoral politics, and particularly a further move away from the urban working class that was favored by Strasser. We're going to be looking at Hitler's peasants and his campaign to capture the rural vote. Then what we're going to turn to is the growing influence of the Nazi party, brought on primarily by the coming and worsening then of the Great Depression. And finally, we're going to conclude with Hitler's rise to power at the end of 1932 before claiming total power the following year in 1933. Propaganda became central to Hitler's campaign to claim power as he could no longer use violence to achieve his aim. Despite the Nazi party's propaganda efforts, it still struggled in the electoral arena, winning no more than 4% of the vote in 10 provincial elections during 1926 and 1927. Thus, the party looked to the 1928 Reichstag elections for redemption. The Nazi party had no interest in governing, be clear about that, but rather wanted to use the electoral gains it achieved to destroy democracy. And you can really see this in the document that you're reading in this class, where you see Goebbels' disdain for parliamentary activities. And he is very clear about what the Nazis seek to do by gaining seats in the legislature, in the parliament. In the May 1928 elections, the Nazis would win just 2.6% of the vote. So even here, we're seeing failures. But despite this lackluster showing in the 1928 elections in May, the Nazis found that they did well in rural areas. And this would encourage them and push them to distance themselves even further from Strasser's, Strasser's working class focus. So for instance, even as the Nazis struggled in urban areas in the May 1928 Reichstag elections, for instance, they would win just 1.8% of the vote in Berlin, they won 18.1% in rural counties in Germany. Growing support in the rural north would in fact encourage Hitler to downplay socialism even more. Why? Because he realized that bankruptcies and foreclosures brought on by the inflation led many farmers to turn to protest. And as they were protesting, they would link themselves more and more closely to the extreme right. The Nazis would in fact win a claim from the farmers by advocating for a self-sufficient autarkic Germany, using tariffs to prevent the import of foreign foodstuffs. So clearly Hitler has his eyes on this rural voter because he realizes that the future and fate of the Nazi party stems on getting these voters to support his party. 
To further his cause, in 1929, Hitler would encourage the Nazi party to change its, one of its planks in its 25-point program. And this plank, as you will see in the document that you read for this week, was point 17. Point 17 spoke of the need for, quote, the free expropriation of land. This, of course, for Hitler and his rural followers, seemed far too socialistic. So therefore, Hitler now claimed that it only applied to those Jews who were speculating in land. So here we see this combination killing two birds with one stone. Hitler's going to appeal to the rural voters, but he's also going to now even more so appeal to those anti-Semites in Germany who he wants for his party. Well, as a result of these efforts, in 1929, the Nazi party won 13 out of 25 seats in the town council in Coburg. This would become the first municipality under Nazi control. So in short, what we see during this time is the future is looking bright for the Nazi party. I want to say one thing in closing before we move on to the next slide. And that is this image that we see on the right. And the individual that we see on the right is Walter Dare. And he will be writing one of the documents that you're reading uh, in this class. And he is speaking in front of a sign that says blood and soil. And this is going to be a key element as well in the German ideology, the Nazi German ideology, I should say, where you're going to see a connection between the belief that the rural German is the most pure Aryan, the most pure German. And that is another reason, besides these more pragmatic electoral concerns that I've been speaking about in this, in this slide, of why the Nazi party seeks to go after these rural farmers. Because again, they are deemed the purest in terms of Aryan blood and German blood. So ethnicity plays a key role as well as nationalism in this appeal to the German worker. We can see this ideology in Nazi propaganda. And this Nazi propaganda would continue to portray the German farmers as the core of Germany's racial and economic stability. Always keep in mind, threatened by the so-called Jewish capitalist and Jewish Bolshevist. This is shown in an election poster for the Reichstag election in 1933. So I want to spend a couple seconds here looking at what this election campaign poster from 1933 shows. The panel on the far left reads the following. Foreclosure auction, this is how it was. I referred to this point earlier that a lot of farmers, particularly the Protestant farmers in northern Germany, were growing angry with the economic depression that Germany was facing during this time. Their farms were being foreclosed, therefore they were protesting, and they became attracted to the Nazi party. So the Nazi propaganda machine is clearly playing on that sentiment in this left panel of this screen. The center panel reads, Bolshevism, Bolshevism, Vism, this is how it could be. So now, for those individuals the farmers and urban workers who might be enticed by socialism, this middle screen is meant to say, hold on a second. If you thought it was bad in the left panel where you have the men holding the children and the crying wives who are in a dire situation, if you think socialism is gonna be any better, this is not gonna be. Rather, it will lead to death and destruction, fire, and brimstone if you look at this center image. The third panel on the right, on the far right, reads free farmers, free soil. This is how it must be. And here we can see clear as day in the center, the Nazi symbol, the swastika, looking over the farmer as he's plowing his land with the farm. And this is what it could be if the farmers voted for the Nazi party. Beneath all these panels, it says the following, Hindenburg and Hitler to the rescue. And this is, again, prefacing what we're going to be talking about later in this lecture, but also what we talked about previously. If you remember in the last lecture, we talked about 
Paul von Hindenburg coming to power in 1925, winning the presidential election in 1925. And if you remember when I was talking about his victory as a candidate for all right center right parties, I talked about that being the beginning of the destruction of German democracy. And that is kind of, again, preceding what we're going to be talking about later in this lecture and then the following lecture for next week about Hindenburg basically giving power to Hitler and giving power to the Nazi party. As most Germans and most global citizens, for that matter, struggled through the Depression, for the Nazis it was actually good times. Why? Because it allowed them to basically take control of Germany and lead it down its path to control by the Nazi party. October 29, 1929, Black Tuesday, the New York Stock Exchange collapsed, thus beginning the Great Depression. Almost immediately, American loans to Germany ended, forcing Germany to find a different way to pay back its war debts. So this is where we get to, if you remember the, the character, the individual that we mentioned earlier in the semester, Stressman. He was succeeding in sort of holding the middle ground and keeping Weimar democracy alive. Well, his death, along with the Great Depression, would push that possibility far, far away into the dustbin of history. And instead, what we're going to see is the Weimar government, unable to find a way out, Chancellor Hermann Muller would resign on March 27, 1930. This event represented the start of German democracy's downfall. Adding to Germany's problems, unemployment would continue to skyrocket. You can see the numbers here on the screen. In 1929, about 1.9 million people were unemployed. By 1930, that number would rise to just over 3 million. By October 1932, 5.1 million. And when Hitler, just after Hitler and the Nazi party took power in Germany, February 1933, 6 million Germans were unemployed. And leave no doubt about it, Hitler and his Nazi followers would play up the plight of the German people. We already saw it with the German farmers, with the campaign ads, with the foreclosures and uh, not allowing socialism to take over the country. We're going to see it even more so as the depression worsens. But as the German people were facing plight, the Nazis experienced tremendous growth during this same period. The Nazis party membership, as you can see on the screen, rose from 108,717 in 1928 to almost triple 293,000 by September of 1930. The party had also been succeeding in regional elections in late 1929 and 1930, whereas the Nazis had won just 800,000 votes in the 1928 Reichstag elections. It won 6 million in 1930. This 6 million votes it won in 1930 was 18% of the electorate, second only to the Social Democrats, the party, the party of the Weimar Republic. So clearly here by 1930, the fortunes of the Nazi party seemed to be turning around. Well, once again, the Nazis found their greatest success in the rural areas some of which they won, where they won 60% of the vote. These middle-class farmers, along with artisans, these artisans included plumbers, electricians, carpenters, but also small shopkeepers and teachers, were increasingly worried about the Depression and looked to the Nazi party for salvation. The Nazis, after all, were a good choice, a lot of these people felt, because after all, the Nazi party had promised to protect these groups from the international financiers and the big Jewish department stores that were claiming all the business away from the German shops. Well, in the end, as a result of this smashing success in the 1930 Reichstag elections, 107 Nazi deputies would take their seats in the Reichstag. They were not interested in passing laws. We saw this clear as day with the Goebbels document. Instead, they chanted Nazi slogans when in the parliament, they shouted down government spokesmen, 
and they ridiculed the smaller communist delegation. Consequently, consequently, because of this just pure and utter chaos and commotion in the Reichstag, it met only rarely. And this is where we see the death of the Reichstag at the end of this lecture slide. So I want to give you these numbers here. You don't have to remember the specific numbers, but just recognize this as a symbol not only of the death of the Reichstag, but a further demise of Weimar democracy in Germany. So where is the Reichstag? used to meet about 100 times per year in the 1920s. It met only 50 days from October of 1930 to March of 1931, which was more than the three days it would meet between July 1932 and February 1933. Why did it meet so few times? Well, because of the chaos that was wrought by these Nazi clowns, basically, Chancellor Heinrich Brüning would increasingly rule through emergency degree, meaning that the parliament, the Reichstag, had no say in what was actually going on in Germany. Leave no doubt about it, by 1932, the Nazis were a force to be reckoned with on the political scene. But I also want to be clear, and this is why I have this on the slide, 1932 was a year of speed bumps for the Nazi party. In fact, they will begin the year with the defeat in the presidential election and they will go on to lose power in the Reichstag as well. But their fortunes will increasingly change due to a terrible scheme put forth by an individual by the name of Kurt von Schleicher that encouraged President Hindenburg and other German leaders to turn to Hitler for an alliance of sorts that will allow Hitler's foot to be in the door and therefore open that door up for a Nazi takeover of power. So I want to talk about these speed bumps that the Nazis experienced in 1932. First of all, Hitler. Hitler would run for president in 1932 and he would fail utterly. As for the Nazi party, it continued to do well until the elections that were held on November 6, 1932. On this election, on November 6, 1932, the party picked up 2 million fewer votes. And as a result, they would lose 34 seats in the right stick. So what were the reasons for this, these defeats, beginning with president, the loss of the presidency, of uh, the chance for the presidency in 1932, early 32, and then this November defeat of 1932? Fundraising problems was key. The Nazis had a money problem. Low morale among the Nazi leadership and its followers was another issue. The public was also beginning to question the Nazis, particularly middle class voters. They were worried about the Nazi party's support of striking Berlin transportation workers. Finally, there were some people who were beginning to question why Hitler, despite being asked to enter government, an alliance with governments, was unwilling to do so. So what about this alliance with government officials? I wanna talk about a guy that we see on the screen, the name Kurt von Schleicher. Kurt von Schleicher was a former general staff officer who headed the liaison office between the army and President Paul von Hindenburg's office. And Kurt von Schleicher had been trying since May 1932 to find a way to get Hitler into the government. But as you see in, I believe it's the Goebbels diary for this week's reading, we will see Hitler refusing over and over again to these demands for an alliance. Why? Well, Hitler demanded nothing less than the chancellorship. Hindenburg, at this point at least, refused to do this. So as a result, Hitler rejected the pleas, even after it was hinted that once an authoritarian regime took over as planned, Hitler could then become chancellor. So we begin to see these early rumblings, but it's not enough for Hitler. Hitler wants to grab the seat of power and he wants to grab it extremely quickly. So as all this was going on, we will eventually see Schleicher removing, maneuvering to have himself become chancellor, which he does become for a very short period of time beginning on December 3, 1932. Well, to make matters worse for the Nazi party, 
which had suffered another series of defeats in the local elections in early December, Strasser publicly resigned from Nazi leadership posts. So Strasser, the old former enemy of Hitler, who has sort of been in the background, but nonetheless still critical of Hitler, now he makes his most important move here by resigning all his, of his leadership roles. And more importantly, he criticized Hitler publicly for not taking a position in the cabinet that was offered to him by Hindenburg and Schleicher. But here's the other important point. Why didn't this lead to a split of the Nazi party more generally? Well, lucky for the Nazi party and Hitler, Strasser had no desire to take his followers out of the existing Nazi party. Had he chosen to, he likely would have picked up a big group of those Nazi followers and perhaps weakened the Nazis to a level, to a great enough level that would prevent them from securing power in Germany. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about what this resignation did but also other elements within the German Weimar government that finally opened the door for Hitler forming an alliance. So first of all, Strasser's resignation. As you can see here, his decision not to take people with him and on his way out was deemed important by the Nazi propaganda section, which said the following, on the basis of num numerous contacts with our supporters, we are of the opinion that little can be salvaged by way of propaganda. New paths must be taken. Nothing more is to be accomplished with words, placards, and leaflets. Now we must act. So despite the, the non-importance, if you will, of Strasser leaving because he did not take people with him, we see the Nazi propaganda section saying something has to be done. So therefore, we begin to see some changes, particularly as a result of Schleicher's power grab. So as I mentioned earlier, Schleicher, Schleicher would take power as chancellor in December 1932, but this would prove short-lived, particularly because President Hindenburg refused the, to allow the charade to go on, and therefore Schleicher would eventually resign. But here's the thing. Hindenburg was fearful that Schleicher might actually attempt a coup. Therefore, for support, Hindenburg turned to Hitler. For the past month, former Chancellor Franz von Papen had been trying to get Hitler to join him in a coalition government. However, Hindenburg, when Papen, von Papen was taking these chances, Hindenburg was initially reluctant to make Hitler a chancellor, much preferring Papen. Others, however, especially army leaders, feared that a Papen chancellorship would result in a civil war. Therefore, what we see is Hitler will eventually be made chancellor and von Papen will become vice chancellor. But here's the thing. Hitler would become chancellor, but as you see, it was with a catch. What do I mean by that? Well, in return for being given the chancellorship, Hitler had to limit the number of Nazi party ministers in his cabinet to just two. So who were these two men that he chose? Wilhelm Frick. Wilhelm Frick became the Reich Minister of the Interior. And Goring, the old guy who used to be the ally of Strasser, Goring would become minister without portfolio for Prussia. Most of the other ministers in this new cabinet were conservatives. Papen, as I mentioned, would become vice chancellor. And in fact, he would tell his concerned conservative acquaintance, within two months, within two months, we will have pushed Hitler so far into a corner that he'll squeak. So from the Weimar government's perspective, despite allowing the rooster into the hen house, what we see is a lack of concern, a belief that Hitler can be boxed in and controlled. But this was not what all people felt. In fact, Hitler's former ally, General Erich Ludendorff, who we talked about so much in this class already, recognized immediately the error made by those conservative leaders carrying out these backroom deals. He would in fact write to the president, President Hindenburg, whom he had worked with side by side 
during World War I. And what did Ludendorff say? Well, he offered a very prophetic warning. And that warning was the following that you can see on the screen. I solemnly prophesy that this accursed man will cast our Reich into the abyss and bring our nation to inconceivable misery. Future generations will damn you in your grave for what you have done. Well, as it turned out, obviously, Ludendorff was correct. And this would open the door by Hitler becoming chancellor to him and the Nazi party taking total control over Germany. And that is a topic that we will pick up with next week.